A Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, Chapter 2, King Arthur's Court. The moment I got a chance, I slipped aside privately and touched an ancient common-looking man on the shoulder and said in an insinuating, confidential way, Friend, do me a kindness. Do you belong to the asylum, or are you just here on a visit, or something like that? Mary, fess, uh, me seem it. That will do, I said. I reckon you are a patient. I moved away, cogitating, at the same time keeping an eye out for any chance passenger in his right mind that might come along and give me some light. I judged I had found them pleasantly, so I drew him aside and said to his ear, If I could see the head keeper, a minute, only just a minute. Pray, they do not let me. Let you what? Into me, then, if the word be pleasy better. Then he went on to say he was an undercook and could not stop to gossip, though he would like it another time, for it would comfort his very liver to know where I got my clothes. As he started away, he pointed and said yonder was one who was idle enough for such a purpose and was seeking me, besides, no doubt. This was an airy little slim boy in shrimp-colored tights that made him look like a forked carrot. The rest of his gear was blue silk and dainty laces and ruffles and he had long yellow curls, and wore a plumed ink satin cap tilted complacently over his ear. By his looks, he was good-natured. By his gait, he was satisfied with himself. He was pretty enough to frame. He arrived, looked me over with a smiling, impotent curiosity, and said, Come for me, and inform me he was a page. Go long, I said. You ain't more than a paragraph. It was pretty severe, and I was nettled. However, it never fazed him. He didn't appear to know he was hurt. He began to talk and laugh in happy, thoughtless, boyish fashion as we walked along. He made himself old friends with me at once, asked me all sorts of questions about himself and about my clothes, but never waited for an answer. But always, ch always chattered straight along, as if he didn't know he had asked a question and wasn't expecting any reply. Until at last he happened to mention that he was born in the beginning of the year 513. It made the cold chills creep over me. I stopped and said a little faintly, Maybe I didn't hear you right. Say it again. Say it slow. What year was it? 513. 513? You don't look it. Come, my boy, I'm a stranger and friendless. Be honest and honorable with me. Are you in your right mind? You said he was. Are these other people in their right minds? He said they were. And this isn't an asylum? You, you mean, I mean, it isn't a place where they cure crazy people? He said it wasn't. Well then, I said, either I'm a lunatic or something just as awful has happened. Now tell me, honest and true, where am I? In King Arthur's cult. I waited a minute to let that idea shudder its way home and then said, and according to your notions, what year is it now? Five eight twenty eight, nineteenth of June. I felt a mournful sinking of the body and muttered, I shall never see my friends again, never, never again. They will not be born for more than thirteen hundred years yet. I seemed to believe the boy. I didn't know why. Something in me seemed to believe him. My consciousness, as you may say, but my reason didn't. My reason straight up began to clamor, and that was natural. I didn't know how to go about satisfying it, because I knew that the testimony of men wouldn't serve. My reason would say they were lunatics and throw out their evidence. But all of a sudden I stumbled on the very thing, just by luck. I know that the only eclipse of the sun in the first half of the 6th century appeared on the 21st of June, A.D. 528, O.S., it began at three minutes after twelve noon. I also knew that no total eclipse of the sun was due in what was to me was the present year, that is, 1879. So, if I could keep my anxiety and curiosity from eating the heart out of me for forty-eight hours, I should then find out for certain whether this boy was telling me the truth or not. Wherefore, being a practical Connecticut man, I now shoved this whole problem clean out of my mind till its appointed day and hour should come, in order that I might turn all my attention to the circumstances of the present moment, and be alert and ready to make the most out of them that could be made. One thing at a time is my motto, and just play that thing for all that is worth, even if it's only two pair and a jack. 
I made up my mind to two things. If it was still the 18th century and I was among lunatics and couldn't get away, I would presently boss that asylum or know the reason why. And if, on the other hand, it really was the 18th century, all right, I didn't want any softer thing. I would boss the whole country inside of three months, for I judged I would have the start of the best educated man in the kingdom by a matter of 1,300 years and upward. I'm not a man to waste time after my mind's made up and there's work at hand on hand, so I said to the boy, Now, Clarence, my boy, if that might happen to be your name, I'll get you to post me up a little if you don't mind. What is the name of that apparition that brought me here? My master and thine, that is the good knight and lord, like lord Sir Kay the Seneschal, forced a brother to our liege the king. Very good. Go on. Tell me everything. He made a good long story of it, but the part that had an immediate interest for me was this. He said I was Sir Kay's prisoner, and that in the due course of custom I would be flung into a dungeon and left there on scant commons until my friends ransomed me, unless I chanced to rot first. I saw that the first chance at the best show, and I didn't waste any bother about that. Time was too precious. The page said further that dinner was about, about ended in the great hall by this time, and that as soon as the sociability and the heavy drinking would begin, Kirkay would have me in and exhibit me before King Arthur and his lustrous knights seated at the table round, and would brag about his exploit in capturing me, and would probably exaggerate the facts a little. But it wouldn't be good form for me to correct him, and not over safe either. And when I was done being exhibited, then ho for the dungeon, but he, Clarence, would find a way to come and see me every now and then and cheer me up and help me get word to my friends. Get word to my friends. I thanked him. I couldn't do less, and about this time a lackey came in to say I was wanted. So Clarence led me in and took me off to one side and sat down by me. Well, it was a curious kind of spectacle, and interesting. It was an immense place, and rather naked, yes, and full of loud contrast. It was very, very lofty, so lofty that the banners depended ending from the arch beams and girders away up there floated in a sort of twilight. There was a stone-railed gallery at each end, eye up, with musicians in the one and women clothed in stunning colors in the other. The floor was a big stone flags laid in black and white squares rather battered by age and use and needing repair. As to ornament, there wasn't any, strictly speaking, though on the walls hung some huge tapestries which were probably taxed as works of art, battle pieces they were, with horses shaped like those with children cut out of paper or creating gingerbread with men on them in scale armor, whose scales are represented by round holes, so the men's guns coat looks as if it had been done with a biscuit punch. There was a fireplace big enough to camp in, and its projecting sides and hood of carved and pillared stonework had the look of a cathedral door. Along the walls stood men-at-arms in breastplate and morion, with halberds for their only weapon, riches as statues, and that's what they looked like. In the middle of this groaned and vaulted public square was an oaken table, which they called the Table Round. It was large as a circus ring, and around it set out a great company of men dressed in such various and splendid colors that it hurt one's eye to look upon them. They wore their plumed hats right along, except that whenever one addressed himself directly to the king, he lifted his hat a trifle before as he was beginning his remark. Mainly they were drinking from entire ox horns, but a few were still munching bread or gnawing beef bones. There was about an average of two dogs to one man, and these sat at expectant attitudes till a spent bone was flung to them, and then they went for it by brigades and divisions with a rush, and there ensued a fight which filled the prospect with a tumultuous chaos of plunging heads and bodies and flashing tails. The storm of howlings and barkings deafened all speech for a ton of time, but that was no matter, for the dog fight was always as big as their interest anyway, and men rose sometimes to observe it the better and bet on it. And ladies and musicians stretched themselves out under their blue strids over the same object, and all broke into decided actuations from time to time. In the end, the winning dog stretched himself out comfortably with his bone between his paws and proceeded to growl over it and gnaw it and reach the floor with it, just as fifty others were already doing, and the rest of the court resumed their previous industries and entertainments. As a rule, the speech and the behavior of these people were gracious and courtly, and I noticed that they were good and serious listeners when anybody was telling anything. 
I mean in a dog fightless interval, and plainly too they were childlike, a innocent lot telling lies of the stateliest pattern with the most gentle and winning naivete, and ready and willing to listen to anybody else's lie and believe it too. It was hard to associate them with anything cruel or dreadful, and yet they dealt in tales of blood and suffering with a guileless relish that made me almost more get to shudder. I was not the only prisoner present. There were twenty or more. Poor devils, many of them were maimed, hacked, carved in a frightful way. And their hair, their faces, their clothing were caked with black and drenchings of blood. They were suffering sharp physical pain, of course, and weariness and hunger and thirst, no doubt. But at least none of them had given the comfort of wash, nor even the fore charity of a lotion for their wounds. Yet they never heard them utter a moan or groan, or saw them show any sign of restlessness or any disposition to complain. The thought was forced upon me. The rascals! They have served other people so in their day, it being now their own turn. Now they were not expecting any better treatment than this. So their philosophical bearing is not a come of mental training, intellectual fortitude, reasoning. It is mere animal training. They are white Indians. End of chapter 2.